Welcome all. Thank you so much for coming and joining me today for my Colors of the Garden presentation. Whether you're watching in person or virtually on the recording, I really appreciate it. Today we are learning about the colors that are found in our gardens and backyards, and we'll be taking a look at the purpose and function that those reds, the greens, the yellows, all of those beautiful colors have. But let me introduce myself. My name is Marissa with the Art of Ecology, and my whole business here, the Art of Ecology, is geared towards building connections between people and the natural world via programs like this or in-person programs. Here in this picture, I am teaching a botanical dye course, which heavily focuses on the plant pigments. So we can learn more about these amazing pigments by creating dyes for textiles or for paint. I also, as an artist, do art sales and merch sales and a portion of all the proceeds, whether it's a program or an art sale, always go back to supporting wildlife conservation and habitat preservation efforts. So thanks for supporting this and for supporting me. I do have a list here of some upcoming virtual events. So if you are watching the recording, or you're not local, you never have to worry about, oh, I wanna join in, but I can't be there in person for a workshop like the Botanical Dye. I do have many virtual programs coming up, so stay tuned for those. But today we are working on and learning about pigments and colors and why do they exist? What is their function? So we'll take a look at the purpose and then at these four basic pigments, green, red, orange, and yellow, which we'll go in a deep dive for what those are. Now, when we have our gardens, we're usually looking at beauty and what brings us joy. Personally, my favorite color is yellow, so I have a lot of yellow plants in my garden because when I come home or when I'm going outside, just seeing that sunshiny color is really very joyful to me and brings me great happiness. So of course, when we're planting a garden, we're often thinking of what colors do we like? And whenever I'm installing a rain garden or a pollinator garden or doing a restoration for someone. I, I find it interesting. People either tend to lean towards cool colors or warm colors and having that nice rainbow is not always uh, what people are looking for, but that's okay, right? There's beautiful, beautiful flowers, lavenders, delphiniums, catmints, uh, hardy plumbagos that fall into the cool color category. And then we have beautiful, beautiful fire pink, sunflowers, primroses, um, tick seed, coreopsis, all sorts of great things that fall into the warm colors. And that's awesome. But those colors are for more than just bringing us joy. They actually help the plant survive in one way or another. And these survival mechanisms that are part of these pigments also benefit us if we're eating them. I also do a lot of foraging and herbalism. And it's amazing the, the role that pigments play in the plant also benefits us. And no, we're not going to suddenly be able to photosynthesize if we eat our leafy greens, but there are several pigments that are designed to boost the plant's immune system or prevent cancer uh, from UV light radiation. And when we ingest these plants, we're also gaining some of these immune and anti-carcinogenic benefits too. So there's some cool ways for us to incorporate knowledge about pigments. You know, this is fun trivia for you to learn, but you can incorporate this into your daily life by starting to think more about what foods we're eating, as well as, as I mentioned before, we can create some really stunning paints and pigments and dyes out of plants. And we can incorporate this into our art projects as well. 
So first we need to really take a look at what these pigments are. And these are all primary and secondary metabolites. And we're gonna be looking at these backwards. We're gonna start with secondary metabolites and then we'll move on to primary. What this means, fancy science word for what makes us live, what chemicals make us live. Primary metabolites, I'll just do the quick, quick basic definition, is something that is going to maintain plants' base survival. So I'm like, I'm not talking about looking pretty or, you know, self-defense. I'm talking about their ability to photosynthesize to respire, to breathe, respire, and to just standard grow. These are the basic things. And primary metabolites help the plant do that. Secondary metabolites, though, is what we're going to start with here. They are the kind of secondary survival mechanisms. So immune system support, self-defense, things like that. And there are kind of three basic categories of these chemicals. First, we have alkaloids, which are super, super nitrogen rich and super, super bitter. Usually they are very, very bitter. And these are all found within plants, different plants. And that bitterness is, you. I mean, think of when we have like arugula or bitter dandelion, we taste it and we're like, whoa, okay. It's very good for us, but imagine being a deer or a rabbit or a groundhog and we taste that bitter. Whoa, that's too much and we don't want to eat that anymore. Oftentimes, if it's really that bitter, the plant is showing an herbivore, hey, I'm probably poisonous. You don't want to eat me. Bad things will happen to you if you continue to eat me. And the herbivore is like, okay, peace. And it will leave. Alkaloids are, again, these chemicals that will do that. And pigments are chemicals that just have a color associated with them. And any pigment that ends in I-N-E is an alkaloid. We often think of plant chemicals that are alkaloids like caffeine, morphine, cocaine. Uh, even though it doesn't sound like an ene, it still has that I-N-E. But in a pigment sense, we have something called berberine. And here we have a picture of a Japanese barberry, here number one, and the Latin or scientific name for barberry, for Japanese barberry, is berbergis thunbergi. And the berbergis comes from the word berberine. So this plant in specific is really heavy, heavy, heavy on that berberine pigment and it can be seen in the root systems and in the, in the bark itself. Barberry, Japanese barberry, is also really great to use to create a very beautiful chartreuse sort of green pigment in textiles when you bind it to cellulose. So if you're ever dyeing a t-shirt, barberry can make a really beautiful dye. Then we have phenolics. If you think of the word phenolic acid, that might be something we're familiar with. And these are chemicals that help the plant respond to environmental stress very specifically. And I kind of break out browsing and just general herbivory from, you know, that poison that is in an alkaloid that maybe is, hey, don't eat me because you'll die versus don't eat me because I want to live. Phenolics will help to deter overbrowsing, so a deer from getting a little too crazy on the browsing. It will help to boost immune support in the plants, protects against fungi, pathogens, you know, think of how we get sick. Plants can get sick too. And it also helps protect from sunburn. I mean, think of it, they're eating sunlight in a way. That's how plants get energy. So they're designed to have lots and lots of light shining down on them. Imagine if we went to the beach, lots and lots of light shining down on us without any sort of sun protection, we get burnt. We run the risk of skin cancer. And think of these delicate leaves. They run that same risk. It's just not skin cancer. It's 
leaf cancer or stem cancer, any sort of tissues can get cancer. Then we have the third kind of category of secondary metabolites, and those are terpenoids. These are the largest kind of group here and include both red pigments and orange pigments, and they help to moderate growth. That's kind of their primary purpose, but they also will taste a little funny to deter browsing and prevent over excess of insect damage, which we think of lots of caterpillars eating plants, you know, insect or emerald ash borers, things like that can cause damage to plants. So I kind of highlighted some of the roles that those pigments will play. However, there are some extras and I'll go into a little more depth here. First, these pigments want to attract pollinators, right? We've got these beautiful, beautiful colored flowers and they're saying, hey, pollinators, I'm a big flag. Come, come over here and get nectar and then you'll rub up against the pollen and move it to the next flower, ha ha ha. Plants want to bring pollinators over. They want to bring herbivores and seed eaters over because how else are their seeds going to be dispersed? We think of dandelions like the little poof balls. You make a wish as the little fuzzies fly off. They're wind dispersed, so that's cool. But what about all the berries, the seeds, the nuts? How do those get dispersed? It's by herbivory. An animal, think of a raccoon or a squirrel, will munch on their seeds, move it to another area, or they'll ingest the seed or the fruit right there, and then they'll scamper off, life is good, and then they poop it out in another location. And now these plants have these perfect little fertilizer packets that the seeds are in, perfect for germination. So plants want to look yummy, either to be pollinated or to have their seeds dispersed. Next, we have number two is protection from those environmental stressors. So again, sunburn, getting sick, things like that. We have deterring herbivory. And again, some is very natural, right? When we think of pruning a tree, that's, and it makes it helpful. You know, the plant is going to grow better. Growth is stimulated. It's going to you know, not rub up against each other in a weird way. Pruning is good. Deer do that naturally. They go and they munch on either the woody tissue or the leaves and they support the plant. They're helping to stimulate healthy growth. So that's a good thing. However, if done in excess, that can stunt the growth of the plants and damage plant tissue. So the plants will want a little bit of herbivory, but they can start producing extra chemicals to say, okay, you've had enough. I'm tasting bad now. And the deer uh, in Africa, it's very commonly seen in giraffes. You know, any sort of herbivores will say, okay, all right, I've had enough and they'll move to the next plant. And finally, they want to have the pigments, those chemicals to boost their immune system. Again, just like how we can get sick, think of viral infections, right? We're breathing them in, they get in our mucous membranes. And no, plants don't necessarily have a mucous membrane like we do. They don't have a nose or eyes or mouth or ears that things can get in. But think of how often a plant is getting cut or damaged anytime an animal takes a bite out of it. Any sort of herbivore, any sort of caterpillar, that's happening. Then we have lawn mowers that just run over root systems that might come out of the ground. We have all sorts of insect damage, such as that emerald ash borer, spotted lantern fly. We've got woodpecker damage, uh, yellow belly sap suckers, pileated woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers. You know, we have damage that just occurs. And that's just what happens. And now all of these are sites for a virus or a bacteria or a fungus to enter and make the tree sick. So they want to have really great immune systems that can handle 
all of that damage that they naturally go through. So now we get into the colors. So this is right now where we're going to be starting with our primary metabolites here. This, the greens, we see it everywhere in plants, right? It's everywhere. And the greens are so important to necessary survival. These are important for the essential functions. So chlorophyll helps photosynthesis happen. So that is a primary function, primary metabolite of a plant. We'll talk a little bit more about what photosynthesis is, what's actually happening there. But green is the color that's going to be doing it. That pigment of chlorophyll helps to create food for the plant. And it's found in such high concentrations that it outcompetes in presentation of what we see. It's going to outcompete every other color. Think of it this way. If I have a canvas that I'm painting, you can see one of my canvases here in the background of my screen. There's lots of colors. Say I put purple on there and yellow and red and I paint this lovely little scene. Looks great, lots of colors on there. And now I'm gonna take an entire paint bucket, whole gallon paint of green, and I'm just gonna dump it on my canvas. You are not going to see any of the other colors underneath. It doesn't mean they're not there, it just means you can't see it because the green is so overwhelming. Now, in some instances, which we will also take a look at, the green might not be present in the way that it should be. It could either be a genetic mutation. And a lot of times if we're houseplant lovers, we actually love this mutation. Not so much in the natural world, but houseplants are very, very sought after if they are variegated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too. But let's take a look at photosynthesis and what is actually happening. Why is green so important? Why is it seen everywhere? So here we have a hawthorn, right? So we've got the branch, we've got its flowers, we've got the leaves, we've got the fruits. This is a wonderful, wonderful plant. And these green leaves do something very, very important to the survival of the plant. Without these leaves going through photosynthesis, none of the plant would be able to survive. We see the green here. So now zoom in, we're looking deep at each individual cell of this leaf. And inside each individual cell of the leaf is the chlorophyll pigment. And now chlorophyll pigments are contained We've got our chloroplast, which is, is that big, we see this in every single plant cell. It's green, lots of chlorophyll. Chloroplast is kind of like the name of the, the organelle. So each chloroplast, it's green, can go through light dependent reactions, meaning it needs the sunshine. And it also goes through light independent, meaning it doesn't need sunshine to function. The plant survives at night, right? Now, both of those reactions, both light dependent and light independent happen. They're, they're going at the same time and they're giving each other nutrients in the form of energy. We've got different types of energy that's being produced. We have energy in the form of ATP, something very specific, and ADP. And in order for these reactions, light dependent and light independent to work, they need that little form of energy. It's kind of like a cycle. It's going around and around and around and the light and the water comes in and produces oxygen. And the carbon dioxide that we're breathing out, that all mammals, all animals are breathing out, is pulled in, doesn't need light to happen. It creates glucose. And as the carbon dioxide creates glucose, it also creates ADP. And that ADP is used in the light dependent reaction. And as the light and the water comes in and creates oxygen, it's also creating something called ATP, which is used in the light 
independent reaction. So it's this huge cycle that's happening. And as light comes in, it bounces off the, uh, the light photons will bounce off the chloroplast and everybody gets so excited and they start vibrating and shaking and it's crazy and we can produce energy. So that, I know it's a lot of stuff stuff that's going on. And I could even spend a whole nother hour just talking about photosynthesis and what is going on in a chloroplast. We could get real crazy about this whole cycle here and just talk about that. I'm not going to bore you with that though. But I want you to know when you look at a leaf, when you look at the color green in nature, that's what's happening here all of that work. So green is so important for the plant's survival. We see what's going on here is a nice visual diagram, but we also have the formula, the chemistry formula of carbon dioxide plus H2O. So these, these little symbols here go in to the system. We add some sunlight and out comes oxygen and C6H12O6, which is a usable form of energy called glucose. Again, really crazy. So anytime you look at green, that's what you're seeing just on a tiny, 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 tiny microscopic level. So now this is the word form of that diagram. Ultimately, light is hitting the chlorophyll. It's exciting the, the cells who then are able to pr promote and create this usable form of energy of glucose that will kind of drive the rest of the plant since they're not ingesting things like we would ingest food. When we look at a plant, it's often found in the leaves. Leaves are huge, huge. They're like little solar panels on the plant. Sometimes they're found in the stems and occasionally the sepals, which are, if we think of, it's really easy to see in a rose. We have that bud that has those weird little leaflets protecting it. And when the rose blooms, it has those little leaflets that get pushed down. Those are the sepals. Sometimes those are green too. Everything green does photosynthesis. Now, again, if we have houseplants, we may be very familiar with the term variegation. And when portions of the plant is seen in this maiden fern here, maiden hair fern, we see little striations of white or sometimes they're big splotches um, or maybe large streaks or an entire half of the, the leaf might be white. It looks really cool. But this is a mutation that in the natural world, the plant does not want to happen because what this is, is a lack of chlorophyll pigment. In the natural world, that doesn't fly. That's not good. The whole plant needs to be at top capacity with chlorophyll. Otherwise, it's not able to produce enough energy. So we may see it every so often. I've seen a variegated plantain leaf, like once. But otherwise, the plant is going to die out because it does not have enough energy to continue living. House plants, we're the, we're the parents, we're feeding it, we're supporting its growth, so it's okay. But out in the natural world, it's very difficult to survive, which then leads me to this next plant. This right here, this is called ghost pipe or Indian pipeweed. Depending on your um, geographic location, they might be called different things. And it's all white. How does that survive? Because that's how it's supposed to look. And that's because it's a parasite. It doesn't need to undergo photosynthesis to get energy. Its roots feed off of and will absorb nutrients from other plants nearby. So we often find it in forest understories on the forest floor, kind of buried in leaf litter, especially really close to other trees. So it'll grow up and use the nutrients from the tree as its food source. So it doesn't need to be green. Why produce all of that color when we don't need to? 
So then we think of the fall. What happens to the tree? We have all these deciduous trees that are dropping their leaves. They're changing their colors. And this, again, goes back to that parasitic ghost pipe of why spend all that energy producing the pigment when you don't need it? Chlorophyll is actually really, really hard to make for the plant. So it doesn't really have a huge net energy gain. As the days get shorter and shorter and there's less light available to be eaten or ingested by this plant, the, the cost outweighs the benefit. It's too expensive energy-wise to produce chlorophyll. So the plant will say, okay, you have done your job. Thank you so much. And it will reabsorb that chlorophyll pigment and store it in, if it's a tree, it stores it in the woody tissue or the root system, or if it's like a perennial, it might, um, the leaves might just die back and be stored in the root system to, you know, come back next spring. Again, just like that canvas example that I used at the beginning, all the other colors that were underneath the oversaturated green now get to show, which is where we get cool fall foliage from. Then we have evergreens. They're green all year round. So does that, you know, how do how does that work? That even in the winter, they're still green. And this is because they're kind of shedding their needles consistently. They might lose one here or there, or maybe there's some storm damage or some wind and a couple get blown off. But otherwise, the tree is able to say, okay, this needle is old. We'll pull the chlorophyll and drop that needle and use it to help support and kind of uh, fuel future needle growth. So they're able to stay green year round. But now we've got our secondary metabolites or the secondary pigments that are going to be supporting other sorts of things. And we'll start with one of the most easily seen in the garden colors, and that is your reds, your pinks, and your purples. Kind of all fall under one big umbrella of red, which is called anthocyanin. And these anthocyanins, We've got our terpenoids or flavonoids, if you've, if you've heard that in diet terminology. They are the largest group of pigments. That umbrella of anthocyanin has over 600 individual pigment types and all kind of range from that reds to pinks to purples. We've got all sorts of colors in there. You can even see blues in this category. Some examples of anthocyanins include delphinidins, betalanes, pelargonidins, petunidins. And if you look at those words, they look like flower names. They look like delphinium, pelargonium, which is a geranium, petunias, right? We've got all sorts of plant names there, and those are pigments found within that plant. Many of these also, if we're out in our garden, smell really good. These are found in many aromatic plants because aromatic plants have a specific function. These plants, these bright, happy, cheerful plants are flags for pollinators. Hummingbirds, butterflies, moths, skippers, they really like the color red or the color purple. Hummingbirds in particular love red. So we want to be a flag. Hey, pollinators, come over here. So that's why we see a lot of flower petals that are in the red to purple category. Then we have the fact that they defend themselves against insect or herbivore damage with those aromatic oils that I mentioned. Now, this doesn't mean that all things that smell good to us are red, right? Remember the green can still be an overwhelming color, but the red, that anthocyanin is still present. So a lot of mint, lavender, rosemary, sage, uh, these aromatic smell really good plants. They're designed though 
to say, hey, don't eat me. If you're a mosquito or an insect, you might be like, whoa, that's way too much citronella, right? I don't want to be around here. A deer might come up and be like, oh, eh, bleh, okay, all right, bye. That didn't taste good. Now, if a deer is really hungry, it's going to eat whatever it can. So if you see something that's labeled as deer resistant or a mosquito repellent, Usually they are very aromatic and have these volatile aromatic oils that are comprised of anthocyanins at some level, one of the 600 types. Most of them also smell really good to us. So it's nice to have those varieties in our gardens. Anthocyanins also prevent sunburn. If you think of a spirea, which many people have in their gardens or ornamental locations, the little leaves start out red and then they, as they grow and they mature, they get that overwhelming green color. Or if we look out and we see maple leaves that are starting to pop out of their buds, a lot start slightly rusty color and then quickly turn green. And this can help protect those little tiny delicate baby leaves from harsh sunlight because a forest canopy isn't there to protect it yet, or they're not quite accustomed to the harsh light because they're little babies. So many start out with that extra protection. They also boost immune systems. So again, to, you know, jack up all of the immune cells that the, that the plant has if they get wounded or if a virus comes along, they'll have these anthocyanins. In our diet, if we're foraging, we may often be told, wow, eat your dark, the darker the better, and your dark reds and your dark purples. These are superfoods. That's true. They contain these super saturated anthocyanins and also have a benefit. We may hear the word antioxidant. This means that as a plant is trying to kind of adapt and defend itself from extra sunlight or from, you know, the, uh, their immune system, so viruses, bacteria, fungi, all that sort of stuff, extra oxygen molecules can just kind of float around due to the process of creating just energy. And these extra oxygen molecules can bind to anything else that's floating around. They're called free radicals. And these free radicals can be very, very toxic and very damaging. So an antioxidant is no oxygen. So it'll get rid of those free radicals. And when we eat that, that, you know, that happens in us too. So we don't want those free radicals because they often cause cancer. So, and in plant tissues as well. So these antioxidants are really important anti-carcinogenics as well. So that's kind of why we're like, ooh, eat the dark reds. Yay, very good for us. Now we come to blues in flowers. And this is kind of confusing, and I'm not gonna say blanket statement because there's always an exception to the rule, but for the most part, there's not really a true blue pigment. There is one found in a blue pink gill mushroom and in a small handful is in like, I can count them with my fingers, of marine creatures, usually crustaceans, although there is a fish, if you've ever heard of the mandarin goby or the psychedelic dragonette, that fish has a true blue. However, for the most part, it's an anthocyanin pigment that presents itself closer to the blue spectrum. pH also plays a really, really large role in if it looks more red or if it looks more blue. If we think of hydrangeas and we put like pennies in the soil to change the soil pH to make it more acidic or more basic, that changes the color of our hydrangea blooms. So the plant, though, doesn't necessarily need soil to be more acidic or more basic. Sometimes that does play a role, like with the hydrangeas, but it could just be that the cellular structure of the petals itself 
is in a more basic or acidic solution and the cells can moderate that as needed. So delphinidin is one of these anthocyanin pigments known for being in delphiniums, these super blue flowers, which we can see here on this side, on that uh, left image, that present themselves as blue. If we see other blue things, you know, this chicory is, is actually a, a different type of anthocyanin that's, you know, a slight purple that just presents itself as a blue. But many times it's either the anthocyanin pigment or it's just a trick of the light. Lots of plants are an iridescent blue. And this is truly just a light bouncing off of a flat cell instead of a rounded cell, hitting our brains. And our brains are like, whoa, that must be blue because the wavelength of blue is so short. So it's a quick bounce off instead of bouncing and scattering in every single direction, causing our brains to see whatever color, right? A red, a yellow, an orange. Blue is the shortest wavelength. So we'll see that if it bounces quickly. So we think of things like a peacock selaginella or a, if we're looking at the animal world, a blue jay. Neither of those are actually blue at all. It's a trick of the light. And if we pick up a blue jay feather and hold it up to the light, we'll see that it's actually brown. That's iridescence for you. So it's kind of cool to look at how does blue appear in the natural world and where is it actually coming from? In fall foliage, red is a really common color. We usually see it in trees more often. However, there are some perennials such as peonies, hardy plumbago, uh, switchgrass. A lot of ornamental grass types will turn red before they die back in the winter. But if we're looking for how can we add red fall foliage to our landscape, we can take a look at planting red maples, red oaks. If it has the word red in it, you're usually safe. Flowering dogwoods, sweet gums, and black cherries are also really great for it. Then we move on to carotenoids. And just like the name, I mean, we can usually guess what color if we look at just the C-A-R-O-T. I mean, it's missing one letter there, but otherwise, carrots, it's orange. Carotenoids are your orangey pigments. There's over 500 different types. So this is your second largest category of pigments. And they're going to range from reds all the way gradient wise to yellows. Although they'll all have a slightly orangey or golden tint to them. Usually these are found in flowers. Think about um, goldenrod, sunflowers, the butterfly weed here. So we've got lots and lots of beautiful flowers that are trying to be very attractive. So they'll act as these large flags again, this crocosmia or the nasturtium. They're really vibrant to attract their pollinators. And carotenoids also help with light. So they'll protect against harmful UV rays. So they're a sunburn protection again. And so this is what's giving that sunburn protection kind of to the petals. And they also make photosynthesis a little more effective. They will catch way out there outlying light wavelengths and they'll transfer that energy from the carotenoid pigment over to the chlorophyll to say, hey, I know it's not much, but I got something too, here you go. And the chlorophylls will be able to use that to create extra energy. In fall foliage, these, these pigments can kind of change based on environmental conditions. How rainy was it that year? How much storm damage happened? Was it really, really cold or really, really hot? And so we'll see some fluctuations in these specific trees, whereas like red maples are red, right? Red oaks are red. They might be more of a burgundy or a fire engine red, but with these trees, you might see them range from a yellow to a peach to a really vibrant orange, depending on the year they had. Sugar maples, staghorn sumacs, which is this, this one here with the long 
linear compound leaflets. Black walnuts are also really great for that. And sassafras, which is this image here with those like duck feet shaped leaves or mitten shaped. They have three different shaped leaves. They're really cool. Then we have our yellows. And now I put this little diagram in here to kind of show what I mean when I say wavelengths. You can see all the different pieces of the light spectrum here that, you know, chlorophyll is going to get all of this good stuff. A lot of great light here. But then xanthophylls are going to be more on this category. So they're going to be that yellow color as well as kind of a limey or bright green. Whereas carotenoids, which I said can also be yellow, right? Like a sunflower petal. It still is capturing some of the yellow. It's just a little more golden and into the reds. So all of this from, from this edge all the way to here is usable light for the plant to do photosynthesis. Now compared to the carotenoids or those oranges slash yellows, which are primarily found in flowers, xanthophylls, or these more bright, vibrant, or limey yellows, are found in the foliage. And this is to help aid specifically in photosynthesis. So they're catching that outlying light wave and converting it into usable energy, just like the chlorophyll. But it takes way less energy to make a chlorophyll pigment than it does to make a xanthophyll pigment. So they're not as effect effective though. So that's why plants aren't just yellow all the time, right? They're not very effective. So it's really good to have in the fall, right? Just to capture the few extra little things or to still be kind of an accessory pigment. So the green is very present, but the yellow is still in there a little bit just to help. It also is going to be preventing a plant from becoming like super saturated with light, which runs the risk of causing cancer in plants. So plants don't want that. We don't want that, right? So they add this yellow, uh, the xanthophylls or the anthocyanins or the carotenoids all can help to act as kind of this harmful light sunblock. So, if there are any questions, I can take them now. I know I kind of went through that really quickly, but ultimately here, you know, all of these pigments that we find in nature, you know, you can go outside and say, wow, that's green. Or you can look at here in the top corner, we've got clematis flower. If you have that growing in your garden, you can say, wow, that's a purple. And I know what I know what's going on. I know what the plant is trying to do here. And you can observe the plants just out there trying to survive and take a look at what they're doing. So hopefully you have a better insight into the lives of plants and why they are the colors that they are. And maybe you'll be inspired to give your hand at you know, a botanical dye or making your own watercolor paints out of plants. There's some really great art projects to do with them as well. But I will take any questions. All right, and if you don't have questions as you're, as you're watching live, that's okay. You can also, if you think of something later, you can feel free to reach out on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. Um, at the Art of Ecology. I'm also, obviously, you might be watching this on YouTube. You might be watching the recording there, so you can just comment your question there, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer it for you. Or you can feel free to email me. My email is mjacobs at theartofecology.com. So again, just shunt your questions over to me, and I'll be sure to answer them. But otherwise, thank you so much for spending your afternoon, or if you're watching the recording, whatever time it is for you. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.